Nina, if you join us up here. Human activities have contributed to the release of two trillion tons of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. That means 40% more since the pre-industrial times. Now for the oceans, that means 40, 24 million tons of CO2 being absorbed every day into the oceans. So for the acidity, that means it's going to go up. And we call that oceanification. So on this map here, we're going to see uh, the global pH map and uh, acidity has increased 30% since the pre-industrial times. But by 2100, we are expecting to see 170% increase in acidity. So huge changes in really relatively short time. More importantly, these changes are happening 10 times faster than any, any time in the past 55 million years. And the region that is going to be experiencing most changes is really the U.S. West Coast. But in fact, we are seeing these changes happening right now already. So we have heard a lot about the, the shellfish, and I'm sure everybody is aware of the uh, really dire um, die-off starting around 2006. But what we see already now is that really the pteropods, these tiny marine zooplankton, uh, are already affecting, affected in the natural environment. So let's talk a little bit more about pteropods. We've heard them referred to earlier, and now you've brought them up. What exactly are they? Look at them. They're, they're super beautiful, right? They are these tiny marine snails, and they belong to zooplankton. They're basically common in all global oceans, but they are really qu quite common along around our coast as well. So they have this beautiful shell and paired wings, and they are flapping with their wings up and down. During the night, they go to the surface and they feed. And during the day, they descend and they hide in front of the predators. And predators, so basically the animals they feed on them, are these guys, are salmon, herring, birds, and even whales. And so they are really an important component of food webs. They are so beautiful. One of the reasons is because of these really nice shells. But because the shells are so thin, they start to dissolve under increasing ocean mystification. So basically, as we see that the solution, and here we can basically see these white ribs on the, on the figure, this is an indication of the change conditions that are happening in the natural environment. But that's not the case of future scenarios. These changes are happening right now. We can see them around here in, in Oregon and Washington coast. So basically, really, pteropods, and not just the shellfish, are the canary of the coal mine, and that's why they are really so important for the ocean specification studies. We have found that exposure to higher levels of CO2 caused delayed development in Dungeness crab, one of our iconic species in Washington state, and also reduce survival in krill. Krill are, you know, zooplankton. They're planktonic organisms that are really important in ocean food webs. Shellfish really are kind of a sentinel species for understanding the impact of ocean acidification. The uh, changes in chemistry, the fundamental changes in chemistry that result from uh, the burning of fossil fuels and the uptake of carbon dioxide by the oceans uh, has a direct impact on organisms' ability to produce their calcium carbonate shells. And this is not just a local impact that we see here in Washington. Calcium carbonate species are important to society throughout the world. Here in the state of Washington and now increasingly up and down the coast and recently in the northeast as well, we took action. When the alarm bells were rung by the shellfish growers between 2005 and 2009, Governor Gregoire created the Blue Ribbon Panel on Ocean Acidification to chart a course for addressing the causes and consequences of OA. From that first of its kind um, in the country body came a report and a technical scientific paper of findings and recommendations for actions. They were incorporated then into the regional 
uh, recovery plan of the Puget Sound Partnership, and simultaneously, as most of you know, the legislature created the Marine Resource Advisory Council, which was charged with taking that groundbreaking report off the shelf and implementing the findings. We work with the shellfish industry um, to use their knowledge to uh, better serve us in, in synthesizing uh, what's going on. So hatcheries in particular can serve as working laboratories um, and provide us with lots of data about the fate of the cultured organisms in the lab. And we have learned an enormous amount from our partners um, in hatchery settings. All of these efforts inform the other. So the monitoring data inform the modeling. They also inform the biological, the design of the biological experiments that we perform. The biological experiments provide data that then uh, are used to guide the modeling and to revise and adapt some of the monitoring programs. So all three of these points interact themselves and they then point towards the center and really enhance not only our fundamental scientific understanding, uh, but more importantly, they, they tend to inform our options for mitigation and for adaptation to the problem. What do we see in the future for the Ocean Acidification Center specifically? We want to extend our understanding of biological and ecological responses. We want to know what the ecosystems are going to be doing, not just what the chemistry tells us. As important as chemistry is, ecosystems, I think, are where it's at. And we want to be able to plan for mitigation and adaptation. And we need both. What did the ocean science community need that didn't exist? That's what we asked. And how could we create a competition to get there? What would be a game changer? As you know, monitoring ocean pH has been a complicated and costly business up until now and hard to do with any accuracy unless you're in shallow and temperate waters. What if we could put in the hands of everyone monitoring, studying, investigating the process and impact of ocean acidification devices for measurement that were accurate, affordable, durable, calibrated around the world, and better than anything that's ever existed? That's why we're here. And that outcome with the 17 teams that we had competing in this prize, the, this is what we're trying to do. The need is an urgent one. Private philanthropy and science isn't a new thing, but I do believe there is a new opportunity for leadership today, especially in the kind of high risk, new venture and exploratory activities, the very ones that do change the way things are done and the way we think about our world. You know, my husband, Eric, and I deeply believe, given the challenges to ocean health and all, from all the directions that I've just mentioned here, we are at a critical time for understanding ocean systems and the way we interact with them, right? Our living network. It's time to share what we know. It's time to share what we learn and find new ways to accelerate the, the, the pace of scientific research. deploying new monitoring sensors and Wendy we are so excited for the products of your challenge because what we've done is mobilize a lot of people and maybe not all of these assets have sensors now but once those come online we've got that network and we've got a way to transmit data and so we've got a good way to get that collective information. I really am a firm believer that science can make a change. You know, using science to understand, act, respond, and adapt um, is the key for ocean acidification, in my opinion. And so, uh, Ocean Washington Ocean Acidification Center is really trying to connect science with people's needs and policy. And I think that's the way forward. But science really cannot do everything by itself, right? It, we need to start doing our action. We need to start reducing CO2 emissions and all local sources that are contributing to the certification locally and uh, develop adaptation strategies, you know, innovative solutions that can really be applied locally to reduce 
the levels of oceanification to make a positive outcome in the future.